the trick is to go really slowly. And the problem is people take a practice test, they run out of time. So then for the next practice test, they're thinking, last time I took a practice test, I ran out of time. So this time on this practice test, I'm going to try to go really fast. Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by quantreasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at quantreasoning.com. In quant, if you weren't able in two minutes to figure it out, then you missed something really important. And I think the question we did today is a great example of that. I mean, you were confused, distracted, your brain was cluttered because you didn't take a long enough pause at the comma. That's usually the, the type of reason why you would not have been able to figure it out in two minutes. I would say almost always it's because of something like that. I also think that we human beings tend to be optimistic about how long it would take us to make an educated guess. So if you think at two minutes that you can get make an educated guess in the next 30 seconds, you're probably overly optimistic and really it would take not 30 seconds but 60 to 90 seconds and maybe the educated guess isn't quite as educated as you think it will be because you're probably optimistic about that as well. So no. Uh, the only exception is if you're someone who keeps having way extra time on practice tests. Like if you're taking practice test after practice test after practice test and you're always for some reason ending up with more than 10 minutes left over at the end of the quant section, then I would say, okay, fine, you can do that. But that's pretty rare. I think for most people, they, they tend to be in a big rush towards the end of the section. And so no, it's absolutely not worth it. Raise your hand if you also feel that when you check the timer, even if your timing is actually fine, it turns out, but just the act of checking the timer causes you to try to rush a little bit in the next question. Even if the timing was fine, you're just the act of looking, the act of checking the timer makes you go a little bit faster in the next question. So I'm seeing most of you have your hands up. Yeah, and I'll, I'll raise my hand as well. Same thing happens to me. The act of, and it's funny because I tend to end at least with 10 minutes left over in quant, and yet the act of checking the timer makes me speed up my reading on the next question just a little bit, subconsciously. I might not even be aware of it, but I am going to read the next question a bit faster. And is that a good thing or a bad thing on the GMAT, reading the next question a bit faster? Yeah, the fact that the timer is counting down makes you think of uh, those action movies where there's a, a bomb about to explode and, and they're trying to dismantle it before it goes off. And of course, reading the, the next question faster is the absolute worst thing that you can ever do on the GMAT. It's a cardinal sin. It's the, it's the thing that will absolutely push your score down. So if you raised your hand earlier in, an, in the answer to my question, no, you should absolutely not use any of those timing strategies. What you should do instead, and this goes back to JD's question, is cut your losses if you don't have an answer at the two minute mark because it means that you're missing something and then you'll never run out of time and the same goes for critical reasoning as long as i spend as much time as i want thinking about the argument then the answer choices go very quickly and guess what nobody in the history of the planet has ever spent more than two minutes thinking about the argument in critical reasoning it's impossible to take that long. I mean, it's just a, it's three sentences, as Joseph said earlier. It's three sentences. Can you imagine taking more? No, it, it doesn't happen. The longest people could possibly take if they really try to stretch it out is maybe a minute and a half. And as long as you forbid yourself from rereading the answer choices over and over again, you'll never go over two minutes. It's, it's, it's just impossible to spend more than two minutes in critical reasoning with that kind of strategy. When you're in a relaxed state of mind, try thinking about those three sentences for more than a minute and a half, I bet you'll get past the point of diminishing returns. Like there's, there's just not that much to think about. 
Hey, I'm just gonna interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video. I have no idea. I have no idea how much time I'm actually spending on a question. I don't know if I went over two minutes or under two minutes. I don't know. But what I do know is if I read the question as slowly as humanly possible and take as many pauses and possible to digest what I'm reading, I know I won't go over two minutes. It's just impossible to go over two minutes if I do that. There may be a couple of exceptions, maybe two exceptions on the test, and that will be okay because there will also be a lot of exceptions in the other direction where it took no more than a minute and 15 seconds to do the question. You can be really quick as long as you slow down the beginning. And it's, it's very counterintuitive because you're thinking, hey, if I wanna be faster at this, I need to speed up. But the way to speed up is to actually slow down. And this was a great example. The one we did today really doesn't take more than a minute, maybe a minute and 10, if you go extremely slowly. Hearing those words coming out of my mouth, it sounds ridiculous. Like, how can it take less time if you go slower? But if you start trying that on official GMAT questions, official, not third party, official GMAT questions, try really slowing down the front end of your process and you will see how, hey, by the time you get to the question mark, you already have the answer, kind of accidentally. You weren't even... Trying, you didn't even know what you were solving for yet, but you paused at the comma and you paused at the period and you paused at the word and and you paused again at the question mark and you realize, hey, oops, I accidentally answered this question without even trying. It happens to me all the time on the GMAT. But the trick is to go really slowly. And the problem is people take a practice test, they run out of time. So then for the next practice test, they're thinking, last time I took a practice test, I ran out of time. So this time on this practice test, I'm gonna try to go really fast. And then what happens is exactly what happened to JD. They read, oh, what is the largest, largest of these integers? And they're thinking, hey, I don't even need that part in the beginning because you know, they didn't go slowly and they didn't pause. And then they end up spending three minutes on this question and feeling really confused. And then for the next question, they have even less time. So they're going faster and faster and faster and faster. And at the end of the practice test, the second practice test, the score was even lower than the first one. They ran out of time even worse than the first one. And so the, for the third practice test, they're thinking, well, last time I ran out of time even worse than the first time I ran out of time. So in this third practice test, I'm going to have to go even faster. And they get into this vicious cycle of trying to be faster and faster and faster, rushing through the questions, and then taking more and more time on those questions because they were rushing. And the, the faster you go through the question stem, the longer you're going to end up spending on that question because you're totally confused. Remember that analogy with the five puzzles. I don't want all five puzzles simultaneously. I want to get one, complete it, get the next one, complete it, and so on. And once you've had good timing on a practice test, then you're going to be more relaxed in the next practice test, and so on. So if you are stuck in that vicious cycle that I was describing, you want to break that cycle and get into the opposite cycle where you actually end up with time left over. And maybe the best way to start that new cycle, that better cycle, is for your next practice test, start from question number two. Just pick B on question one, start from question number two, glance at the timer and feel good about it. And then on question number 11, pick B again. Like do it in every question that ends with a one. So one, 11, and 21, you know in advance, you'll just pick B and move on. And then question 31, which is the very last question, obviously if you have the time for it, solve it, and if not, guess it and feel good about it. Because you need to break the cycle. You need to get to a place where you're comfortable reading the question very slowly, with a lot of pauses, digesting what you're reading. And by the way, if you ever find yourself having to reread a sentence, that means that you read too quickly. You, you shouldn't actually ever have to reread anything on the GMAT. So if you find yourself, hey, I, I didn't get that, I need to read that again, let that be a warning sign, because that shouldn't have happened, and the fact that it happened means that you're not in the right headspace for this test. If I, didn't, if I had trouble digesting it, that means I'm just reading too fast, and I need to catch myself and, and say, hey, you know, bad Avi, what are you doing? Slow down your reading, this shouldn't have happened. So who among you on your next practice test will try this strategy of 
just picking B on questions that end with 1. So 1, 11, 21, and maybe 31 as well. I'm not saying use the strategy in the actual test. The strategy I give people for the actual test, I think I said this uh, two weeks ago maybe in an AMA, was plan to pick B on question one, unless it's easy, in which case you'll pick B on question two, unless that's easy, in which case you'll pick B on question three. That I think is a good strategy for the actual test. The strategy I was describing now, that's just for practice tests to get yourself out of that vicious cycle that you might be in of running out of time and therefore rushing into the opposite cycle where you are relaxed and you end up with a bit of time to spare and then you're thinking, oh, and the next time it can be even more relaxed and so on. So it's just to stop that cycle because you need to do something aggressive if you are stuck in that cycle to, uh, to stop that cycle. Otherwise, it'll just keep going. So you don't make any timestamps? You don't watch the time at all when you do it yourself? No, no when I see that don't timer in the corner, I just think I just kind of chuckle at it and say, oh yeah, that timer is for other test takers, not for me. That, like that timer is irrelevant to me because I know that I'm not going to run out of time. Why? Well, because for example, in critical reasoning, once I've read the answer choices, I pick one and move on no matter what. And in quant, once I get to the question mark, either I have the answer at my fingertips or I don't. And so, you know, I move on no matter what. And in sentence correction, I take as much time as I want to focus on the non-underlined text and thinking about the meaning that the author is trying to convey here. But then once I go through the answer choices, I pick one and move on no matter what. Same goes for reading comp. So I know that with that kind of process, it's practically impossible for me to run out of time, and therefore that timer in the corner doesn't actually, it's not actually for me. Like, I don't really need that timer because I know I won't run out of time. And why am I so confident that I won't out run out of time? Because I took six official practice tests and never ran out of time. Now, how do you get to the point where you can take six official practice tests and never run out of time? By changing your habits, changing your process. Make it such that it's impossible for you to run out of time because you're not trying to solve every single question. You're just trying to avoid making mistakes on the questions that you're capable of solving in two minutes. That's, that's the whole thing. That and not wasting time on the other questions. That's it. And that's why I answered so emphatically when JD asked, is it appropriate at the two minute mark to take another 30 to 45 seconds to try to make an educated guess? My answer was emphatically, no, no. Because if you do do that, then you're going to feel like you need to rush on the next question, and then you'll be panicked when you look at the timer, and then you'll be in the wrong headspace for a reasoning test, because you'll be in fight or flight mode. And I don't know about you, but I'm not, I'm not capable of good reasoning when I'm, when I'm in flight or, fight or flight mode. I don't think anybody is. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.